Come in. If you have your Bibles, or um, if not, it's going to be on the screen. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read 10 verses starting at verse 36. This is the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, and he began to be grieved and agitated, even to death. Oh, then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's bow forward in prayer. God, as you pull in our minds from the many places that they may be, we pray that you speak to us, that we may receive your word individually and then collectively, that we may then embody it and live it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Since I was a little girl, I would have occasions or seasons where I would have stress, emotional stress or mental stress, and it would wake me up in the middle of the night. And um, a few women in my life would tell me that, yes, this usually means that there's something happening in my spirit, whether I was conscious of it or unconscious of it. And so I would wake up and I would often pray, or I still do because it happens from time to time. And I've learned over time to distinguish between when it's actually something in my spirit or in my mind or in my emotions, and when it's something I actually ate, right, beforehand. You know, I'm getting older now, I can't drink caffeine after 12. Woo, what a verse. Things change as you grow older. And, um, but whenever there's something agitating me, whenever there's something disturbing, I have found that I wake up at the same time between the hour of 2.30 and 3.30 a.m. Yes. And maybe it means that I haven't trusted God fully, or maybe it means I just need to pray, and that's exactly what I do. But at any rate, whenever something is stressing you out emotionally and mentally, it disturbs your rest, it interrupts your peace, it keeps you from sleeping. Now, everything feels worse in the dark. Mm -hmm. Fear and anxiety raises up. And every time it has felt like to me that I was in a life or death situation, even though I never was. But for our Savior in this account today, it was quite the opposite. This is the night or the early morning before Jesus' trial and death. Peter has proclaimed that he will never deny Jesus, though he is not able to make good on that promise later in the week. And Jesus is grieved. He is agitated. He brings the, the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane and he brings them there with him and he is 33 years old and he knows he's about to die. And if you know you're about to die, you have to be sad in some way, sorrowful in some way. Why? Because Jesus was fully divine, but Jesus was also fully human. And being fully human means that we were designed to live and not die. Even our bodies respond in such a way against death. We reject death, right? If you get burned, what do you do? You pull your finger back, right? If something startles you, you jump and you feel it right in your chest. Why? Because it could be something to harm you. Your body is hardwired to, to um, resist pain because pain can lead to death. 
We are not made to die. We are made to live. Yeah. But somehow, people who can sense that death is near find a way to make peace with it. 2012, my father had an illness that came up really quickly upon him. He spent 30 days between three different hospitals. And though he prayed and fought to live, we could all at some point see the writing on the wall. And I can remember sitting in my home, it was dark, when my mom called and she said, baby, you made it home. And they sent your dad home to hospice. Now, I've done enough pastoral care to know the hospice meant the end was near. And I remember crying and feeling trapped. I felt powerless. I felt stuck between the present and the inevitable future. Now, at some point, my dad had to have gone through the same process that I was experiencing only in a more elevated fashion. But the night before he died, he called my mom into the room. And he says, baby, I want you to lay with me. And I want you to pray. Now, every night since he had come home, he had slept with his face away from my mom. But that night, he slept facing her. She prayed. He asked her to rub his head. And after she had prayed, he prayed. And he said, I'm tired. She said, I'm ready to go home. The next day, he died. People who are close to death find a way to make peace with them. But there's a difference between making peace with dying and making peace with the torturous and heinously painful, slow death that Jesus was facing. The crucifixion was torturous. It was heinously painful, yes. and it was slow. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is in this garden with his disciples. He leaves a few of them at one place in the garden. He pulls those who are closest to him, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He says, go a little deeper into the garden with me. And he shares with them, he says, I am grieved. I am deeply and poignantly distressed. He says, I'm agitated. He says, I'm angry and I'm disturbed. We see a glimpse into the vulnerability of our Savior. He says, stay awake with me. He says, I don't want to be alone right now. He says, because I can't sleep. So he leaves them where they are and he goes a little deeper and he falls on his face before God. He says, Father, if there is any way, any way at all, for this burden to be lifted from me, please make that way happen. He waits a moment and he says, but whatever it is that you want me to do, I'm willing to do. We hear in this prayer, apprehension and worry. Apprehension and worry is described or defined as fear. Now we often talk about fear in some crazy ways sometimes in the church. Now, Fear, a spirit of fear is the constancy of fear. That is always living your life, scared, right? That is not what God has given us. But fear in and of itself is not sin. It is actually another way that your body tells you that you are in danger and that you need to seek safety. Fear is only sinful in these pockets of time if you allow it to keep you from doing what is right. But our Savior in this moment is honest. He is honest with God and he is honest with those he is leading. And I'm sorry, but I am hard pressed to ever find sin in the truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus gets up, he goes back to where the disciples are and he finds them sleeping. Now I want you to just imagine what Jesus is facing. And the people who are closest to him have gone to sleep when he's asked them to stay awake. Yeah. It heightens his isolation and how alone he is in his pain. He says, could you not stay awake with me just one hour? Just one. He's frustrated. He said, just pray for one hour so that when you face temptation later, you might be able to resist it. Come on. He leaves them. I'm going back to pray. The second time Jesus prays, his prayer has changed. The first prayer, we see Jesus trying to find a way out of this predicament. 
But with the second prayer, it sounds like he's trying to convince himself that this is the way he's got to go. He says, okay. If the only way to pass through this is for me to endure it, so be it. He is trying to convince himself that this is the way he needs to go. He takes a second break. He goes back. He finds them sleeping again. He doesn't have the energy to say anything. He goes back and prays because he's not fully resolved in his spirit that this is what he needs to do. He prays the exact same prayer again. <sighs> the only way to pass through this is for me to endure it. So it. This time when he returns to the disciples, he says, the time has come. And he is resolved. And we see Jesus go through the five stages of grief. Denial. He doesn't want to face the reality that's before him. Anger. He is angry that he has to do it all alone and by himself. Bargaining. He seeks a po the possibility of being able to get out of it. Depression. He is saddened at the reality that's before him. He is stuck. There's nowhere to go. He's got to go into this dark future. And then finally, acceptance. He is resolved to do this. Now, when I was reading this, now I had read this passage since I was a little girl, right? I'm one of those people been in church since she was little. My daddy was a pastor, all this kind of stuff, right? And you know how you read stuff? And you say, oh yeah, I know that. And you think you get it. Until you live a little and then you experience it. Again. And then you read it again and all of a sudden something else comes to light. I was reading this. And for the first time, I think I actually was able to go back and look at Jesus' life, not with fresh eyes, but with a vulnerable heart. And what I discovered amazed me. I discovered that Jesus had a profound amount of loss in his adult life. He had a first cousin, or a close cousin, by the name of John the Baptist. He and John the Baptist were close in age. And John the Baptist was the one that prepared the way for him. John the Baptist was the one who grew up with him. John the Baptist was the one who baptized him. So he was at fundamental spiritual moments of Jesus' life. Jesus, John the Baptist was his only contemporary outside of his mom and his dad. And he didn't have to constantly convince of who he was. Right. Right? But John the Baptist was decapitated by a spineless and feared king. Why? Just because his daughter-in-law wanted it done. He had done all the right things. We see in scripture Jesus was grieved by this. But in the midst of his grief, while he is grieving the loss of his cousin, the loss of someone that he loves, all the world, as most of us who have experienced grief will know, goes about its way. We're stuck while everybody else is living their life. Jesus befriended folk. He poured into these disciples. He loved them. He gave into them. And when he needed them the most, they were not there. They betrayed him. They turned their back on him. Betrayal pierces trust between two people. In saying that they were denying Jesus, they were saying that all the time you spent with us, Jesus, all the love you gave us was a lie. Jesus sat quietly as people falsely accused him. He was found not guilty, but still sentenced to death. He had done every single thing right. The only human being to ever do every single thing right. He made every right decision. He loved people. He saved people. He spoke the truth. He healed people. And what did he get in return? He got isolation. He got pain. He got suffering. He got despair. He got death. And I realized, in this way, Jesus is with us. Yes. He is not immune to the brokenness and the pain of this world. But if even Jesus struggled, if even Jesus had pain, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us if our Savior endured these same things? And I found myself asking a question, and this is the question I feel like we need answered today. And that question is, how is it that a broken and vulnerable Savior, at the greatest point 
of his weakness is able to avenge the world of death and grant hope. That's the question we have. Amen? Amen. Amen. Focus on 
on the beauty, never ever how we made it. Focus on the chains, never focus on the slavery. slavery, slavery. I think I'm free. Uh, 
Alright, we got one of these church crowds today. Amen. I mean, you know, sometimes you wake up and you wish you could go back to sleep again. Yes. Hello, 
right? Yes. And, you know, how many of y'all ever had a splinter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, your body is telling you you get ready to die. <laughs> I mean, all the pain receptors in your body is telling you that the end is near. And your brain, everything is like, oh my God, you, 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 you understand that you're in a whole lot of pain because of the splinter. <laughs> and it was somebody trying to Yeah. It 
you not only in your life, but in the life of the person you're doing good for. Avengers assemble. Avengers assemble. 
everybody flies on in. <laughs> Makes them big jump. I, I like to be the Incredible Hulk, amen. Ask about that later, amen. God bless you, amen. <laughs> but a vision of the symphony, my brothers and sisters, guess what? We are called to bear witness. Yes. God is calling for the church to assemble. The body of Christ to assemble. As Avengers with a small A. Jesus is our big Avenger and we are the small A Avengers. We are bearing witness. That guess what? Death has been defeated. Show up standing with me, everyone. Just take a few. 